from the Cannon House office building. This is Representative Michael McCall. He's a Republican from Texas. The Homeland Security Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations, and Management serves as their chairman. Representative McCall, several bills this week specifically dealing with cybersecurity. What's the message? Well, I think it's a historic week. We haven't had uh, cybersecurity legislation like this on the floor in the history of the Congress. So I think the message, though, uh, is uh, that America is under attack, uh, that we've been hacked into, uh, uh, both in the private sector and in the federal government. Uh, about a trillion dollars uh, of intellectual property have been stolen from the United States from countries primarily like China. Uh, and then when you look at the espionage piece, uh, it's even more frightening. They have stolen the br blueprints for the F-35 uh, Joint Strike uh, fighter plane, for instance, just, just one example of many military secrets that they have stolen. Uh, they're very interested in satellite rocket technology. Uh, and then finally, when you look at the cyber warfare piece, that's the one that really keeps me up at night. Uh, this is the ability to go in and hit uh, critical infrastructures through the click of a mouse and bring down power grids, electrical grids, uh, nuclear plants, uh, financial institutions, uh, FAA, you name it. Anything connected to the Internet is vulnerable. And so what we're attempting to do, uh, really two, two things. One is to harden the federal networks so that they can't uh, steal this information from the federal government. And, and number two, to have a, a sharing of information between uh, the federal government and the private sector in terms of signature threat information so that the private sector, which controls about 90 percent of the critical infrastructures, can better protect itself. If I can just say every federal agency has been hacked into, including the Pentagon, and uh, imagine if uh, agents of a foreign power uh, stole paper files uh, out of the Pentagon, classified or non-classified, uh, and they got caught. That would be all over the front page of the Washington Post. Now, uh, yet in the, in the virtual world, that is happening every day. So that's a, that's a threat. I think the legislation we have this week uh, is uh, uh, is good legislation to remedy that problem. So before we uh, go further, we have uh, about uh, 20 minutes with our guests. So if you want to ask them questions about cybersecurity, the numbers on your screen: 202-737-0002 for uh, Republicans, 202-737-0001 for Democrats. 202-628-0205 for independence. How does your legislation, the Cybersecurity Enhancement Act, differ from the others? Uh, you know, mine, uh, <clears throat> frankly, passed uh, unanimously out of committee, uh, bipartisan support in a very partisan charged Congress that we're in. It's refreshing to see that kind of uh, uh, solidarity behind a bill. But it, essentially, it, it, it hardens the federal networks. Uh, it, it allows NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, to uh, apply uh, standards to the federal networks, uh, to harden them, to protect them from the, the threat of a cyber attack, uh, first and foremost. Secondly, it has a research and development uh, component that also involves the uh, universities, bringing the universities in, which I think can, can be a great uh, uh, asset to uh, uh, our ability to protect uh, uh, the country. Uh, it, it also has an education and awareness piece. When you talk to, like, uh, for instance, the NSA, they'll tell you that computer hygiene is so important. If we could educate and make people aware of how these people get into your computers, how they attack you, uh, <clears throat> and have better computer hygiene, uh, that would cure probably 80 to 90 percent uh, of our problems. And so, and then finally, the procurement practices. Uh, we, we need to have more certification standards in the industry in terms of how we procure hardware and software, uh, which we think will have a ripple effect in the private sector, uh, and, and I think that's going to do a lot of good. What we tried to avoid at all costs was, was mandates uh, to the private sector. Um, uh, we tried to incentivize rather than be punitive. Uh, Port Charlotte, Florida, Arlene, Arlene uh, first call, uh, Democrats line, hi. Hello. You're on. Talking about the circuit boards that we have built over in China and all the other countries, if we built them here in the United States, our computers would be more secure. I used to build motherboards, and you can manipulate components that go into these motherboards, and they go into our computers, and 
that's what's kind of messing up everything in our in our world, really. If we built our own, we'd be much more secure. Well, Thank I think, you. I think the caller makes a good point, and um, you know, look, China is is so advanced at, at this uh, game. Uh, they they have uh, stolen. <laughs> Uh, so much, uh, it really rivals the size of the Library of Congress, the amount of data uh, that they have stolen. Uh, and any time you uh, travel to, say, China, uh, yeah, I wouldn't advise taking your BlackBerry. They're, they're so sophisticated at getting into your electronic devices. Uh, and so, um, anyway, it, it, it's a big threat. Uh, I think the caller knows the threat, obviously. What, we're try what I've tried to do, I was on the Speaker's Cyber Task Force, chair of the Cybersecurity Caucus, and I've been, for eight years, been trying to raise awareness, uh, not only to the American people, but members of Congress, uh, as to the high level and seriousness of this threat. Our military knows the threat because they have the offensive capability. Uh, they know day in and day out what we can do offensively. Uh, that kind of uh, capability in the wrong hands would be a huge threat. Finally, and I know you want to get to some callers, but when I asked uh, the director uh, of NSA, uh, can we expect a, a cyber Pearl Harbor? His response was, the, the question is not uh, if, but when. Uh, Albany, New York. Good morning, Tim. Independent line. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, no doubt that cyber terrorism is probably one of the scariest new frontiers we have. However, it seems like every SOPA or CISPA is too far reaching and can be used against the American citizens themselves. Uh, just over what could be a ridiculous reason. I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. I'll take my call off there. And Representative, he used the acronym CISPA. If you can expand on that and let our viewers know what it is, too. Uh, did you say Stuxnet? CISPA. CISPA. Yeah, yeah, look, we have a lot of offensive capabilities that can't be turned against us. Uh, uh, I can't speak as to the you know, origin of these or Stuxnet without getting into the classified uh, realm. Having, having said that, uh, anything we can use can be turned against us. Uh, it's it's almost like uh, when we created the nuclear bomb, nuclear weapons. Uh, the genie's out of the bottle on this stuff. Uh, and it's an ever-evolving industry, just like when they, they call them computer viruses because these viruses are ever-evolving. Uh, and, and the idea that they can be turned against us is very real, uh, a very real threat. The Stuxnet one, if I can speak to that, it is a uh, highly sophisticated uh, reprogramming uh, virus that was sent into the nuclear facility in Iran, blew up their centrifuges, uh, and they didn't even know it was occurring because on, on their video screen they couldn't even see it was happening. Uh, now that, that turned against us uh, is obviously a very scary idea. So we, we have to always stay ahead of the curve. Again, we're very good at the offensive capability, but it's the defensive side of things that we're, I think, that's where we're vulnerable as a nation. That's where we're weak, and that's what we're attempting to uh, correct and remedy with the legislation, uh, cybersecurity legislation that we have uh, on the floor this week. Other cybersecurity bills released, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, also known as CISPA. This was released by Representatives Rogers and Rupesberger, and the Federal Information Security Amendments Act, released by Representative Darrell Issa. Houston, Texas, good morning. This is David, Republican Line. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I have a brief question for you, uh, Congressman, in regards to how you plan on the bill that you sponsored to implement the advantages that private companies and nonprofit companies have in giving you information to establish the roadmaps that you need in regards to completing the task of getting one in, everyone intertwined and safely involved in regards to protecting their systems. Do you plan on uh, endorsing competitive bidding processes for these companies in regards to the supervision of obtaining that information or working on those projects similar to other processes that have been endorsed by you? Well, any of the information sharing networks, and I, I, the prior caller, I, I didn't hear his question in terms of the intelligence bill, so I do want to speak to that. Uh, any of these information sharing concepts we have, let me say first and foremost, are completely voluntary. Uh, this is a... Uh, any private company, again, 90% of the critical infrastructures are controlled by the private sector. So what we're trying to do is encourage and incentivize them to work with us, with the federal government, uh, so we can share the signature threat information. 
these would be, you know, various viruses that we can share with them how to put a patch on to, pr to protect themselves. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's a voluntary system. With respect to the intelligence bill that's out there, uh, there was a pilot program called the Defense Industrial Base uh, Program uh, that worked very well uh, with the federal government uh, sharing this information with the private sector. Uh, and we want to do it in a protected environment where these companies are protected uh, from vul vulnerabilities. Uh, if we can't work together with the private sector in sharing threat information, and that's, that's all this bill does, is share information with the private sector. The private sector can share information with the federal government in terms of threat-specific signature threat information. If we can't do that, we can't solve this problem because that goes to the core uh, of where we are. Uh, and I can tell you this pilot program was highly successful uh, in protecting not only the private sector from these threats, but also educating uh, the federal government as to how to better protect the federal networks. Are there concerns from the private sector by exposing how they operate by sharing this information? Uh, I know there was some concern um, uh, voiced with the bill that's still being worked on at the Homeland Security. A committee. I, I think above all, what we want to avoid when you get into the internet and cybersecurity is uh, a burdensome regulatory framework, mandates, and being punitive. Uh, those three. I, we, I think when you start crossing that uh, bridge, I think you get into trouble uh, as a legislature. So we're trying to avoid those. What we're again trying to do is make this a voluntary system and incentivize the private sector rather than start mandating things and telling the private sector what they have to do and what they, what they can and cannot do. The Hill newspaper reports that Representative Dan Lundgren had a piece of legislation called the Precise Act, and one of the th reasons they didn't make the floor is because it, wouldn't, uh, it would create new regulations. Well, I, I, you know, I think the, the, the industry had some issues with the bill as it came out of the subcommittee. Uh, I believe those uh, issues were, were cured at the full committee markup, when I talked to Secretary Napolitano and the Director of NSA, what they said was essential was that the existing legal authorities uh, through presidential directives and executive orders be codified and that there be an information sharing uh, uh, system program put in place, which we were able to do uh, in that bill. And I think that alleviated a lot of the concerns that the private sector had. Unfortunately, the, uh, on the other side of the aisle, the Democrats objected to the bill. And uh, it is not a, a bipartisan bill, unlike the other four that are going to the House floor. Uh, unfortunately, the Homeland Security bill has been very uh, partisanly divided. Uh, every Democrat voted against it. So I think leadership made the correct decision to hold off on that bill until we can get more bipartisan support for that bill. One of the lines from the Hill piece said that House leaders made it clear they wouldn't support any bill that creates new regulations for cybersecurity. Is that the case? I, again, I, I think our, you know, I was on the, the uh, Speaker's Cybersecurity Task Force, and our recommendations were uh, to incentivize, not mandate, to, to uh, make it voluntary, not regulate. Uh, and again, when, when you get into the Internet, and we saw what happened with SOPA, for instance, I mean, you got to be very careful about what you're doing as, as a legislator uh, when you're dealing with the Internet and cybersecurity. I've, I'm always, uh, certainly our philosophy is one, uh, more to, to incentivize and, and, and not uh, have punitive measures on the private sector when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. Moline, Illinois. Dan, Democrats line. Good morning. Good morning to you, too. <clears throat> I just got a couple simple comments to make. Uh, first off, don't you do any background checks on the people that you hire? And the second one is, why would you put these major facilities online so anybody can get onto them? Well, uh, of course, uh, uh, most uh, federal employees, if not all, go through background checks. I used to work in the Justice Department, and I went through uh, numerous background checks uh, in my career prior to, to, to Congress. <clears throat> but the fact is, uh, you know, in this age of, of the Internet and computers, uh, we're all tied to it. We can't simply just unplug ourselves from it. Now, having said that, at the very classified level, uh, we do have very... Um, uh, restrictive measures to basically unplug it from from the internet, so there isn't that uh, that connection. Uh, 
there are some ways that they, they have still tried to get in to steal uh, classified information, but uh, I'm, I'm very, um, I feel very confident that our classified information is very well protected. There's the .gov uh, and there's a the .mil. And the .mil is very well protected. The .gov, which is more the civilian side of the uh, 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 of the uh, federal government, probably a little more vulnerable and open to an attack because it's very uh, tied to the internet. We're, you know, like I said, we're ever evolving. Uh, the Einstein program that the Department of Homeland Security developed is a great program to harden our federal networks. And I think uh, we just moved uh, the bill out of Homeland Security where I introduced a measure to, to enhance the Einstein program, which I think will protect our federal networks. Spokane, Washington, on our Republican line, Mary. Yeah, um, I'm calling, uh, number one, to say that, you know, I really don't think we need these regulations. If anything, Internet should be governed from town to town or state to state by the civil laws that already exist in that state. So if you're not allowed to have a porn shop within five blocks of the school, you shouldn't be allowed to watch porn five blocks within a school online. But when it comes to this Homeland Security I think it's a farce to the fact that we're not calling it what it is, which is the Continuous Government Act that was written up in 1983, which is to constantly keep the state and the federal powers at control at all times because of um, social strife amongst the commoners within our United States, you know, basic people like you and me. And I don't think that we need to have more regulations by our government. And we need more deregulation, um, even though I tend to be more on the um, Democratic side of things. I, we need to dereg. And I don't feel that it's going to do any justice for America as long as we continue to pay officials $80 an hour to make these decisions when they're just turning around and giving people that work for 30 years of their life only $3.80 to live on on Social Security. Caller, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the caller. I think uh, that's that's why I, I emphasize to the speaker being on the task force that we do not want to go down the road of regulating and putting mandates on the, on the private sector. And secondly, we need to always be mindful of the civil liberties and privacy protections uh, that we have put in these uh, bills and this legislation, uh, because uh, you know, my philosophy is that you know we we don't want an overreaching federal government, and particularly when it comes to the internet. If I can just add a, another uh, plug, if I can, I, I introduced a bill. There was uh, the United Nations has been <laughs> at the direction of China and Russia has been looking at censoring the internet and regulating the internet, and so I have a resolution uh, that I introduced to uh, call upon our ambassador to the UN to oppose uh, this resolution in the United Nations. The last thing we want is for the United Nations to be getting into the business of censoring and regulating the Internet. Next up, Spring Valley, Illinois. Jason, Democrats line. Yeah, I just got, I got two questions. Uh, one, what are the consequences of, of the actions of cyber attacks, and how do you plan on catching uh, the cyber attacker when he can do it anywhere in the world? Well, I, I think I've outlined the threat well in terms of, you know, they have the, the ability, not only uh, uh, intellectual property theft to the tune of a trillion dollars, uh, espionage in terms of stealing our military uh, secrets, you know, cyber warfare to bring down our power grids, financial institutions, uh, FAA, you name it. Um, we have very sophisticated uh, techniques to determine whether an intrusion has taken place. For instance, the CIA probably has 100,000 attempted hacks per week. Uh, the House of Representatives, I think we have close to a million uh, in, in, attempted intrusions, but we know about those and, and, and the members are notified. Uh, and, and very few are successful, that's the good news. Uh, they can sometimes intrude and get in, uh, but when they have to beacon to get out of the system, there's a wall that stops the beacon from escaping and getting back to the perpetrator. Attribution is very important here. Anytime we've had a cyber attack, being able to attribute that back to the source and to the computer and then find out who was behind that act and who was behind the computer, very, very important in these, in these investigations. I will say the FBI was extremely successful in bringing down some of these, these uh, hacktivists, the anonymous groups, LulzSec, 
uh, bringing down, you know, multiple bad actors who have been responsible for the crashing of websites, the stealing of Social Security numbers, uh, you know, credit card theft, like in Stratfor, my hometown of Austin, Texas. And these groups are out there very mischievous, but they're also stealing a lot of uh, uh, economic information that's very damaging. That's the point I ha haven't made yet, but, but I'm, we're very concerned about these groups as well. Representative in USA Today, they have comments made by Rear Admiral Samuel Cox, who's the Director of Intelligence at U.S. Cyber Command. He told a group in Washington that the United States would use cyber weapons against an adversary's computer networks only after officials at the highest levels of government approved the plan, and that's according to him. What do you think of that as a strategy? Well, that's, I think that's appropriate. It's, um, you know, a lot of people don't realize when you can blow up a power generator through the click of a mouse, they don't realize you can even do that, but you can. And so it's an act of warfare. We have to define in the cyber world what is really an act of warfare here. And I think we have to be very careful when we use that capability uh, to do so uh, with approvals you know, at the highest levels. Because it, it is, in my judgment, an act of warfare. The, the, the challenge is determining what is an act of warfare from a rogue nation or state can we attribute the, the act of warfare to bring things down, which is essentially what they want to do, is shut things down? How do we attribute that back to the computer? And then do we have good intelligence to determine, was that a state-sanctioned act, or was it just some rogue operator uh, that wanted to, to blow things up? So th this is going to be the future of warfare. Uh, make no, when you talk to the military, <laughs> knowing what our offensive capability is, our defensive is not as good as our offensive. But they will tell you this is what they're most concerned with in terms of defending the nation because they know what we can do offensively. And it will be, in addition to kinetic response, it will be the future warfare. And he also added, the story says he played down the prospect of an enemy of the U.S. Of the enemy of the US could disable the nation's electric power grid or shut down the Internet because those systems are designed to withstand severe cyber attacks. We have hardened those networks. The Aurora Project, was, which has been declassified, was an Idaho National Lab uh, program where, through the click of a mouse, they literally blew up a power generator. I think CNN broadcasted this. You could, you could see the generator actually starting to <coughs> destroy itself through a reprogramming virus like the Stuxnet virus. Uh, by doing things like that, just like when we look at viruses and develop vaccines to protect you know, humans from viruses. Same thing in the computer world. We have developed better vaccines, if you will, to protect our critical infrastructures. Representative Michael McCall, Chairman of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Oversight, Investigations, and Management, thank you for your time. Hey, thank you so much.